Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to the 2022 Tom Price Master's Forum in Rule of Law. Today, we are immensely honored to have the 2022 Tom Price Laureate in Rule of Law, Professor Cheryl Saunders with us. She will join us remotely later from Melbourne. Now we would like to invite Vice President of Academia Seneca, Dr. Huang Jingxing to give us the opening remarks. Welcome, Dr. Huang Jingxing. Good morning, Professor Saunders, Professor Wang, Professor Ye, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, warm welcome to 2022 Town Prize Master Foreign Rule of Law. It's my pleasure and privilege to open this event on behalf of the Academia Sinica. We are very happy to receive the invitation from the Town Prize Foundation this year to hold this meaningful event jointly. And we would like to thank the National Taiwan University College of Law for the great assistance in moderating this forum. Although the pandemic has changed our plan, we are still honored to have the opportunity to invite Professor Saunders to give us her insight through the internet and to spread her thought worldwide. Professor Gerald Saunders is the 2022 laureate of Town Price in rule of law. She is a pioneer in comparative constitution law and an academic practitioner who applies her scholarship to inspire and advise constitutional making exercises with vision, wisdom, and persistence she also consistently engaged with local experts and scholars to share comparative constitution knowledge. Today, it's a great pleasure that young scholars and the activists get together to talk about public participation in Taiwan. It's also thrilling to see so many young students participating in this event. Conversation with diverse perspective and dialogue between people from different backgrounds are always what we are looking forward to. I, be, I believe this would be a very inspiring discussion Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Huang. Now, we would like to invite the Dean of National Taiwan University, College of Law, Dr. Wang Huangyu, to say a few words. Welcome, Dr. Wang. Good morning, Vice President Huang, Professor Ye, Professor Zhang, and Professor Saunders, and ladies and gentlemen, I'm very honored to be here for the Town Price Master's Forum in Rule of Law. It has been 10 years 
since the town price was established. We know that the spirit and idea of the town price in rule of law are to pursue justice, peace, improvement of human rights, and sustainable development. In the past 10 years, we have seen the laureates of this prize make continuous efforts to advance developing countries' recognition of and respect for the rule of law and human rights. They also fight against poverty and inequality and speak for disadvantaged immigrants and prisoners' fundamental rights. This year, the laureate of this prize is Professor Cheryl Sanders. She is a world-renowned constitutional law scholar devoting to the study of comparative constitutional law. At this critical moment, when Taiwan is going to amend its constitution, I believe that the speech delivered by Professor Saunders today will enlighten us and help us rethink various issues of constitutional change and engineering. Finally, I wish the forum today the best success. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Now we would like to take the group photo. Please remain in your seats, and we will let our photographer to take a photo from the stage. At the same time, later we will have our forum started. In the forum, if you have any questions in the middle, please use the Slido link on the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Now, let us welcome the moderator of the forum, Chair Professor of National Taiwan University, Professor Ye Junrong, and the discussant, Deputy Director of Taiwan Youth Association for Democracy, Mr. Lin Yanting, Director of Awakening Foundation, Ms. Chen Wenwei, and Research Professor from Academia Sinica, Professor Su Yantu to the stage. As a reminder of our online viewers, if you have any questions throughout the middle of the forum, please click on the Slido link below and submit your questions there. Thank you. Professor Ye, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our greatest honor to have Professor Saunders with us today for this Master's Forum. On June the 21st, I had the privilege to open the sealed letter and announced that the 2022 Town Prize on the Rule of Law Laureate goes to Professor Shaw Saunders. We were very happy about that, and she certainly deserved it because she is a lifelong contributor to constitutional legal scholarship and also constitutional making in the region and beyond. Many of us may wonder why constitutional law and constitutional practice is so critical to various societies, particularly a society like this one, confronting lots of challenges to transformation and also looking 
for a better future, notwithstanding all of the challenging circumstances that presented in the globe and in national and local levels that we witness every day. Now, like yesterday, we just witnessed an earthquake here in Taiwan. Resilience and also capacity building has been a job for all of us. Professor Saunders has been described by the selecting committee as an academic practitioner and also a trailblazer in constitu comparative constitutional law scholarship and also constitutional engineering. She has been a renowned professor on constitutional law. In Australia, of course, it has, she has been a laureate professor in Australia. Very well recognized constitutional scholar in common law jurisdictions. Actually, I should say in the globe, as she was the president of the International Association of Constitutional Law, when she made tremendous contribution to sort of set up a platform for constitutional lawyers and constitutional scholars to exchange their idea to make a better society for all the nation and state in the world, particularly sort of set up a networking for constitutional scholars, senior and young, to exchange their ideas has been remarkable. More importantly, she focused her work in practice. She is not a renowned professor in a classroom or in her study room only. Her constitutional footprints has extended not only in Australia, in UK, in Europe, but Africa, Southeast Asia, Middle East, and beyond. She has helped involve, participate, and advise constitutional development from South Africa, Egypt, Zimbabwe, the Philippines, Bhutan, Nepal, recently, Myanmar. She also get involved in all kinds of academic and practical you know, practice in almost every part of the world. But we remember that she played a vital role in Asia Pacific region. Lots of us, including myself and Professor Chang, and you know, even younger Jian Zhi, Professor Lin Jian Zhi, many of us, as you can see, also benefit quite a lot from her wisdom, intelligence, patience, and patience in the past. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the honor to listen to Professor Saunders' speech at the venue of Town Prize. Thank you for the executive director, Chen Zhenchuan. He is also here our continued effort to extend our vision and our value you know, beyond Taiwan's boundary. And Professor Saunders is going to give us her ideas and visions about constitutional making, particularly from the perspective of public participation, which is a, a, a vital perspective when it comes to constitutional making. With us also, three discussions. And I would like to mention, we invited them 
to participate. Not because they are great legal scholars or because they are intelligent, but because they got involved one way or the other, in their own way, in constitutional making, in constitutional politics. As a scholar, even when they were student, and also practitioner, they form a kind of network of work and of forces from Taiwan society. As a you know, leader in civil organization, you know, or as a very active student, or as a legal scholar, you know, involved in all kinds of constitutional making. I will introduce them in detail when, you know, when it comes to their discussion. But just to let you know, we you know, are so overwhelmed to have them with us, to have some reflection about Professor Songa's view and vision about constitutional making. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Professor Shaw Saunders, the Royal Rate of 2022 10 Prize on the Rule of Law to the speech. Shaw, please. Well, thank you, Professor Ye, for that extremely generous welcome and also for your uh, collegiality uh, and support over many years. Uh, Vice President Huang, uh, Dean Wang, thank you also for your very kind welcome uh, to this forum. Uh, to the distinguished discussants, thank you for undertaking this task. And to colleagues and students, uh, thank you for being here today. And can I extend my sympathies uh, to all of you for uh, the news about the earthquake, which I read about this morning and was very sad to see. Now, it's a great pleasure and privilege to be able to speak uh, to this Master's Forum today uh, and to mark 10 years of the award of the prestigious Tang Prize in the rule of law, which, and I'm very honoured to be uh, the latest laureate. I only regret that the forum is taking place virtually. Uh, I've been to the wonderful and welcoming campus uh, of NTU many times. I think I may even have spoken in the hall uh, that you're all sitting in uh, at the moment. I'm very sorry not to be there again today, uh, and I hope that it will be possible for us all to meet in person uh, in the not too far distant future. Because I'm speaking from Australia, however, let me begin as I normally would uh, with an acknowledgement of country. I acknowledge that I'm speaking from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I extend my respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging. And so let's get the, uh, the forum underway, uh, and I will begin by sharing my screen, or at least trying to. Okay. Right. So as Professor Ye has mentioned, tonight's, uh, this afternoon's topic is public participation in constitutional change, reflections from a comparative perspective. That was the title suggested to me uh, by the organisers and I uh, accepted very readily because this is an important topic. Uh, it is highly topical. Uh, and uh, it deserves uh, more thought than we commonly give it. So it's, it's a very good choice, I think, uh, for today's forum. I should warn you, however, that I'm treating the subject pretty broadly. I'm taking the notion of public participation broadly and the notion of constitutional change to include both constitution making and constitutional amendments. And we will uh, range quite widely uh, over comparative uh, jurisdictions. Um, treated in that way, it's also quite a complicated topic. So uh, in the time available, we'll only be able to uh, trip over it lightly. Uh, but I hope that we can deepen our consideration, uh, both through the discussants uh, and in the question time uh, at the end. 
I'll be pursuing a few themes through the um, through what I have to say. Uh, one is the interdependence of representation and, particip and public participation in the context of constitution making and change. I'm going to argue that they're both potentially competitive, but also potentially mutually reinforcing. And I hope also to show that both of them are continuing, continuing to evolve separately and in combination with each other. So there's a story about public participation, there's a story about representation, uh, and there's a story about how they uh, interact with each other. And I think that interaction is likely to be enduring uh, over time, whatever that means, uh, although there are challenges uh, to how, these, how both of these systems work, uh, and we'll see that uh, as well. The second theme uh, is uh, both theory and practice. We'll be considering public participation on a theoretical plane uh, and, and in practice. And one of the reasons for that is that much uh, of our current interest, concern about public uh, participation is, is essentially practical. Uh, but of course, it builds on our theoretical understanding of the role of the people uh, in um, underpinning and providing legitimacy for uh, a constitution. So we'll try and uh, see how those two um, sets of perspectives interact. And then finally, a final theme, uh, we'll be considering similarity and difference uh, in global constitutional theory uh, and practice. It's, it's impossible to give a comparative constitutional law talk this, these days without considering the impact of globalization, but at the same time acknowledging the continuing existence of diversity. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a moment. Uh, and the final point I should make from this slide is that I will also be using case studies. Uh, some of this material can be very abstract, uh, and uh, I think it's good to tie it down to earth uh, with understanding of what's actually going on uh, in different places around the world. So in terms of the structure of the talk, I'll begin in a moment by outlining the case studies, and I want to use them for several purposes. One is to identify different forms of public participation. And we'll see that those forms range from the systemic and organized to relatively informal public participation, which I'll actually refer to as public engagement. Uh, and we want to note the ways in which the case studies intermingle public participation and representation. And then at various points during the course of the presentation, I'll come back to the case studies to illustrate particular points. Having done that, we'll move to um, the, the relationship between theory and practice uh, begin with what I'm assuming will be relatively familiar material, uh, the role of the people in constitutional theory, but then considering comparative differences in the ways in which we all uh, think about such things, uh, partly because of theoretical differences in our constitutional traditions, but partly also because of practical differences uh, in our contexts. Uh, then I'll say something about the impact of globalization uh, on these differences. And finally, move to uh, a very topical uh, current issue, which also illustrates the way in which theory and practice uh, interact. Uh, and that's the uh, question of unconstitutional constitutional amendments, the possibility that you might make a, an amendment to a constitution which is not only regarded as unconstitutional because you haven't followed the process, but it is regarded as unconstitutional in substance. And I know that there has been uh, experience of this in Taiwan. Uh, and then finally, under this heading, we'll consider how theory is now enhanced by the practice of constitutional, uh, pub of public engagement. Then I want to pause to say a little bit again about the evolution and continuing evolution of the relationship between public participation and representation. And I'll conclude by talking about three current challenges for public participation uh, in constitutional change. The impact of external or global influences, uh, the need to balance public participation and elite buy-in, using the term balance very loosely there, uh, of course. And then finally, something about the purposes and modalities of the referendum. 
So now let's think about the case studies. Um, I've chosen five uh, very appropriately. The first one is Taiwan, uh, where I know you have a pending constitutional referendum on, I think, the 26th of November. Um, and under your system, as I understand it, the constitutional referendum uh, is initiated uh, by the legislature. It's a difficult process both to pursue the initiation uh, and to pursue the, the referendum. And as I, I think I'm right in saying that this is the first referendum for constitutional change that's been um, held in Taiwan. The second case study, also appropriately, is Australia, where also there's a pending referendum, as luck would have it. Um, we don't yet have a date for our referendum, uh, but it will be on the subject of um, provision of a body in the Australian constitution to provide what's called a voice uh, to the national government and parliament uh, from the First Nations, from the Indigenous peoples of Australia. Uh, Australia has had a referendum procedure for constitutional change for the last 120 years. Um, it's attempted relatively often, but rarely succeeds. Um, out of 44 proposals for constitutional change, uh, only eight have passed and none has even been attempted since 1977. So this um, forthcoming referendum, some stage I imagine within the next 12 months, uh, will be a very significant event here too. Uh, and just as in Taiwan, it's relevant for us to consider about how referendums are conducted. Third case study, completely different, takes us to the island nation of Sri Lanka, uh, which has been undergoing very serious problems of both governance uh, and, um, uh, and economic management. Uh, leading to widespread, huge public protests uh, over the last uh, year or so, perhaps longer. Um, the protesters sought really major constitutional change, potentially uh, in the form of a new constitution. Uh, it looks at the moment as if some constitutional change will eventuate, uh, but it's likely to be fairly minor, um, partly because of the difficulty of translating public protests uh, into formal constitutional action. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Fourth case study, um, the African nation of Kenya, where there's been a very recent uh, court decision called the BBI case, Building Bridges Initiative case. Uh, some of you may already have come across this case, uh, where a very extensive proposal to amend the constitution was invalidated by the Supreme Court of Kenya, although on procedural rather than substantive grounds, even though unconstitutional constitutional amendment was argued. But the case is valuable for us for a whole range of purposes, one of which is the observations made by the courts about the constitutional requirements for public participation, what that means. And in particular, what does it mean for the engagement uh, of the public? in constitutional change. And then the last case study, again, a um, very uh, recent and topical one, uh, comes from the Latin American country of Chile, uh, where within the last month, uh, a new draft constitution drawn up by a popularly elected and very diverse constitutional convention was rejected at referendum by a very substantial majority uh, of voters across Chile. So a wide range of different cases, uh, but all of them bearing on our topic in one way or another. So let's draw some preliminary insights from those cases. First of all, they tell us that public participation may take a lot of different forms. Um, most obviously, as in Sri Lanka, it may involve a public uprising to prompt constitutional as well as other forms of change, or it may involve public engagement at any point in a process to make or change a constitution and in a variety of formats, and that's what the Supreme Court of Kenya talks about. Or it may involve direct election of a body to make a new constitution, uh, whether we call it a constituent assembly or a constitutional convention. That was what happened in Chile. Or public participation may take the form of a plebiscite or referendum. In other words, a direct vote by the people and that may do several things. It might authorise the beginning of a constitution-making process, or it might 
be used to ratify a new constitution or constitutional change. And in Chile, uh, they used a referendum both at the beginning and at the end of the process. Uh, and finally, uh, another possible form of pu public participation is public initiation of constitutional change. And again, that's an option uh, in Kenya. And you may have other examples that we can talk about uh, in discussion time. Second insight from the cases, all these forms of public participation are dependent in some degree on action by representatives, usually by elected representatives. And I won't labor that point, but if you think back on uh, each of these cases, you can see how that's true. I mean, in the case of uh, Taiwan and Australia, for example, the referendum is initiated by action taken in the legislature. Uh, and if those two um, proposals are ultimately accepted uh, at referendum, again, we'll fall back on representatives to implement the change that has been made. Third insight, the relationship between uh, public participation and representation may be constructive and productive. That's really the message from the Kenyan case, the BBI case, uh, where, where the court is thinking about how public participation can be used as a positive add-on uh, to the representative process. But we can also see from our cases that there is potential for tension uh, between representation and participation. Uh, that's certainly been the case in Sri Lanka, for example, uh, where once the representatives took over from the protesters, uh, the um, changes that were made were, or look like being made are uh, extremely uh, limited compared to what the protesters themselves uh, actually sought. So um, we have to start somewhere with our analysis. So let's do this, uh, talking about the choice between direct uh, democracy or in the sense of public participation in the way we've been using it and representative democracy. You know, the debate about the respective merits uh, of direct and representative uh, public decision-making um, stretches right back through the history of the Western constitutional tradition, and I suspect it stretches back through the history of most constitutional traditions, uh, and it continues today, although it varies with context over time. And each of those two modes of public participation, uh, public decision-making, um, Direct, public direct decision making and representative decision making has its own strengths and weaknesses in both theory and practice. So direct democracy in which in some forms at least the people directly decide substantive issues has an almost visceral claim to legitimacy. What could be more legitimate than asking the people themselves to decide? But at the same time, we know it can be complicated, can be expensive, unpredictable, and prone to manipulation uh, in, in practice by representatives or others. Representation for its part, it places intermediaries between the people and the final public decision. So in that sense, it seems uh, less, uh, less naturally legitimate. But on the other hand, it offers a means for accountability and deliberation uh, and and inclusion, and potentially it's more effective for regular public decision-making on what are often complex issues in what are generally large societies. But representation also is under attack uh, in our times uh, for a whole range of reasons that vary, I think, between uh, jurisdictions. Uh, criticisms include the fact that it's generated a political class that representatives are too inclined to be self-serving, that representative arrangements are insufficiently representative, particularly of women and young people, uh, and that they place too much focus on elections and not enough on what goes on in a democratic process between elections. Uh, and these, so this tension between um, direct and representative democracy uh, can play out in any court form of public decision making, uh, but the choice has additional significance in contexts that require a high degree of legitimacy uh, and constitutional change is of course a classic example. It's not the only example. Um, we also see public uh, 
participation and direct democracy being used uh, in cases of secession, uh, as in Scotland, for example, or in cases where countries divide. Um, but we're talking about constitutional change here. And that is a, a classic example of a situation where the stakes are high, uh, where sovereignty is involved, uh, and um, there may be a real uh, need to choose between or find a new balance between uh, direct and representative democracy. So now let's move to uh, more of a theoretical perspective. The central role of the people, which really underpins this notion of public participation and the techniques of representation have been combined in a way that's critical to the story of the legitimacy of written constitutions. The idea that the people uh, provide a source of authority for the constitution uh, is a story that builds the legitimacy uh, of a constitution as the core instrument uh, in our, our system of constitutional government. Now, on one familiar version of this story of the role of the people, which is associated with the French Revolution, the people are the constituent power. They provide the authority for a constitution drawn up by what's typically called a constituent assembly. And the assembly may theoretically be sovereign, but in practice, it's composed of representatives. Such a constitution typically provides for its own amendment in ways that are more demanding than the ordinary legislative process, but falls short of an exercise of pure constituent power. It's derived constituent power. Uh, at best. And consistently with this story of the role of constituent power, it's theoretically possible for the constituent power to revive at any time, to throw out the old constitution uh, and to make a new constitution. I say that's theoretically possible because in practice, of course, it's extremely difficult. And, but over time, the claim that this story makes to conferring legitimacy on the constitution has often been strengthened in various practical ways strengthened by adding a referendum to the beginning or the end of the process or both to emphasize the fact uh, that the constitution is made by the people. And more recently, it's been strengthened by providing for other types of interaction uh, with the public during the constitution making process. Now that's one story of the role of the people uh, in uh, underpinning the legitimacy of constitution. And all constitutional traditions have a story of some kind to explain the supremacy of a written constitution. But not all of them share exactly that story in the same way. Uh, some countries have a less developed notion of constituent power. That's certainly the case here. Uh, and therefore they have a less developed notion of the consequences of constituent power relying instead on a looser notion of popular sovereignty, as in the United States, and many of us have picked up that tradition. Uh, some countries still have a culture of parliamentary sovereignty or supremacy. I think Sri Lanka is an example uh, where they uh, move easily to the assumption uh, that significant constitutional change can be made by the legislature alone. Another different context, nor, not all constitutions can be attributed to an exercise of constituent power at a precise time. Uh, sometimes these are described as uh, transitional. Professor Ye has described the Taiwanese constitution uh, in that way. Uh, and in these cases, constitutions may, for example, have evolved over time as democratization occurs. Uh, so you don't have the big bang moment when the constituent power uh, makes its move, uh, the constitution becomes a democratic constitution gradually over time. A third different context, many constitutions are made or shaped in various but significant degrees by external influences. Japan at the end of the Second World War is an example, and I'll come back to those external uh, influences uh, towards the end of the talk. And then in yet another variation, in some contexts, the people are, themselves are deeply divided so that there is no consolidated constituent power. There are fragments uh, of what might be constituent power uh, who constitute the people of the state. And Sri Lanka has been an example of this over time with quite deep divisions 
between the Sinhalese uh, and the uh, Tamil people, although I think the recent protests have maybe um, seen something uh, of a merger in the public interest. And so these are all complicated, different contexts, which might cause some variation uh, in the story of the theoretical role of the people uh, in constitution making and change. However, now we need to account, take account of the influence of globalization because the current very deep, very distinctive phase of globalization clearly has caused some considerable homogenization of constitutions across the world. And that tendency for ideas to drift together affects constitutional thinking or constitutional theory, as well as constitutional substance and practice. My own view is that it has by no means eliminated diversity, which is very real, uh, but it has tended to rearrange diversity and sometimes conceals uh, diversity in constitutional systems across the world. For present purposes, I'm mentioning it because it's caused the stories of the role of the people as authority for constitutions to converge at least superficially, notwithstanding those underlying differences that we noted uh, on the earlier slide. So now in 2022, uh, the terminology of constituent power is broadly shared across the world, very often used interchangeably uh, with popular sovereignty. Uh, and in states where uh, the constitution has in effect been a transitional constitution and um, the state has democratized over time, uh, we just adjust the theory to say, well, uh, as democratization occurs, the people become authority for the constitution uh, as it has evolved and as it has become democratic. And another manifestation of globalization for present purposes is that the expectation of public engagement uh, in constitution making also now is widely shared. Public engagement being used there uh, to refer to the, the involvement of the people uh, in constitutional change and constitution making uh, at various parts uh, of the process. Uh, it used to be the case that um, popular involvement tended to be stressed more for the purposes of making a new constitution than amending an old one, but even that is changing, uh, as we will see when we look at the BBI case, uh, which we will do in just a moment. So now I want to move to illustrate some of this a little bit more deeply um, by looking at the theme of unconstitutional constitutional amendment. This has been a theory and a practice uh, that has spread very widely uh, across the countries of the world over the last 10 to 15 years in particular, but also uh, over a, a longer time, as, as we'll see uh, in a moment. Um, but I'm using the spread of the idea of unconstitutional constitutional amendment to show how constitutional ideas might converge under the influence of globalization, but still without eliminating difference. Now, the idea of unconstitutional constitutional amendment that we're playing with here uh, is the one I described uh, at the beginning of the talk, the idea that uh, a change is made to the constitution that follows the proper constitutional amending process, but is nevertheless held by a court uh, to be unvalid because it exceeds what the process uh, is allowed to do. Now, historically and conceptually, that approach to unconstitutional constitutional amendment is underpinned by the story of constituent power. The idea is that the constituent power has put this constitution in place, it's put an amending procedure in place, but there are limits to what can be done with that amending procedure. Uh, and in particular, you can't rip the heart uh, out of the constitution. Uh, you can only amend it up to a certain point. Now, um, and, you, and you can see how there's a link there uh, with the, the, the theory of constituent power because it assumes that the constituent power uh, has limited what can be done. Now, this approach to constitutional amendment sometimes is manifested by express limitations 
on the substantive power of amendment. So in a country like Germany, for example, or a constitution like Germany, uh, there's a provision there that while there is a process for constitutional amendment says, but there are parts of the constitution that can't be changed. They are the parts dealing with democracy, federalism, rights, so, et cetera, uh, and they are limits on the amendment power. So that's the, the, the makers of the constitution expressly making that point. Um, but the doctrine that's developed in, um, in recent times doesn't rely on uh, those express eternity clauses of the kind they have in Germany. On the contrary, uh, it assumes that courts can find uh, by a process of constitutional interpretation uh, that the limits of the constitution amendment power uh, have been exceeded. Uh, one of the countries that was the first um, uh, to, to make this sort of finding was India, the modern doctrine is usually traced back to India, where the su uh, Supreme Court of India said uh, in the 1970s, the basic structure of the constitution cannot be amended by the constitution amending process. More recently, um, the limits have sometimes been described in terms of identity of the constitution, or even in terms of the idea of democracy itself. Now, even though this, this, this doctrine has uh, become very much more prevalent uh, across the world uh, in recent times, it also hasn't happened any, everywhere. Um, and I've given you two examples here on the slide. Uh, in Ireland, the courts have said, well, we don't accept that doctrine. Uh, in Australia, the issue has not arisen, but I would be astonished if the Australian courts accepted it. And if you look at those um, examples of countries that have accepted it and have not, um, there are th lots of variables at work. Uh, some of the variables are simply constitutional tradition or the role of courts, but others are, are, uh, take us to the question of what does the constitutional amendment procedure involve? If it's already fairly popular, if it already involves the people directly, maybe there's no room for the argument uh, of unconstitutional constitutional change. That is the case in Ireland and Australia. Uh, and if we compare uh, those uh, amendment processes with say India, where the constitution is relatively easily amended by the legislature, you can see how those differences arise. On the other hand, this is not a reliable rule of thumb, there are also plenty of countries uh, where the referendum is used, which do accept the doctrine of unconstitutional constitutional change. So this is where the BBI decision uh, comes in. Uh, BBI, as I said earlier, means Building Bridges Initiative. Um, the uh, decision relates to the constitution of Kenya, a relatively new constitution dating from 2010. Uh, described by the court in the BBI case as being progressive and inclusion, inclusive and providing a shared vision and a common agenda for the people of Kenya. A very important uh, accomplishment, as I'm sure uh, you'll agree. And one of the reasons for the excitement about the constitution of Kenya uh, is that it replaced with, through a very difficult and drawn out process. Uh, it replaced um, a constitution that had in fact provided a framework for authoritarian and pretty ineffective government uh, in which the constitution had been frequently amended by um, representative institutions alone. Now the particular uh, amendment process under the 2010 constitution of, of, of Kenya uh, is complex. I've given you the uh, uh, the articles there on the slide, if you want to check them for yourselves at some stage. Um, uh, and it involves three different sets of procedures for different types of amendments um, or different circumstances. One of those sets of procedures involves a popular initiative. In other words, the uh, initiation of a referendum process by the people themselves. And if that occurs under these provisions, uh, the, the, the ratification uh, requires passage by the representatives um, at uh, assemblies at the county level uh, and the national level. But the amending process also says, but, and this is a cross-cutting process, 
if the changes are significant, in addition to these steps, popular initiative, uh, representative approval, uh, there also needs to be a referendum. Uh, and so you would need a referendum, for example, if national va constitutional values are at stake, or the Bill of Rights, or the presidential term limits, or the essentials of the system of devolution and some other matters. Now, the BBI case arose when there was a, a wide ranging constitutional amendment. Um, uh, and that was challenged on grounds that huge number of grounds, I can't possibly do justice to the complexity of the case. But for present purposes, one of the arguments was uh, that this BBI amendment would interfere with the basic structure of the constitution. And therefore the Supreme Court of Kenya should decide that the amendment would be unconstitutional if it was carried through uh, to fruition. And other arguments included uh, that the president had had too much of a role in prompting the popular initiative. If, if there's going to be a pro popular initiative, it has to come from the people, uh, not be uh, managed from the presidential uh, office. Now, in the outcome of the case, the challenge to the validity of the attempted amendment succeeded, but it succeeded basically on procedural rather than basic structure grounds. So, or rather than on unconstitutional constitutional amendment grounds. Because the court said, the amending procedure we already have in articles 255 to 257 already strikes the appropriate balance between protecting the constitution and providing enough flexibility for constitutional change. The framers of the constitution, in other words, the constituent power anticipated the possibility that constitutional change would be extensive in the future, and they have provided for it in the amending procedure itself. And therefore, in the Kenyan context, they're not speaking for the world, they're saying in the Kenyan context, uh, and in this particular case, um, the basic structure doctrine just doesn't fit. But in the course of that, uh, developing that argument, uh, the court says all sorts of very interesting um, things about how the amending process must be made to work in Kenya. Uh, so they say, our amending process is elaborate enough for us to say that there's no room for the basic structure doctrine, but the amending process must work so as to engender the participation of the people, uh, must provide deep public participation, must provide the active involvement of all types of people at all stages of the process. It's a very, very interesting uh, set of passages there. I've given you the uh, paragraph numbers from the Chief Justice's judgments. Um, we don't have time to dwell on them now, but uh, you might find them interesting yourselves uh, in due course. So now let's take stock of where we are. What, the current state of play with interdependence of representation and public participation. So we've seen that public participation takes multiple forms in the context of constitution making and change. We've seen that all of those forms, uh, maybe almost all, uh, all of those forms of public participation are dependent on representation to some degree to initiate public participation, to design it, to implement the outcomes and so on. And really that's almost inevitable given the nature of public participation. And we'll, we should talk in the discussion time about whether uh, that's entirely true or not. But the next point makes is, is this, the converse also seems true. It's not just that public participation is now dependent on representation. Representation is now becoming dependent on public participation, at least in constitution making and increasingly in significant constitutional change. So why is this happening? And maybe there's a lot of reasons and maybe the reasons uh, are different in different parts of the world. Um, maybe we now just expect more. Um, of democracy. We expect that uh, in a democratic uh, system, the, pop, the people can be actually involved in matters, in cases where it matters. Or maybe there's just a greater appreciation of diversity and that different people may have different views so that it's important 
uh, to involve uh, people who would normally be un underrepresented in the ordinary representative process. Or maybe it's because there's disenchantment with the representative process in the sorts of ways that I indicated at the outcome. Or maybe there are just simply practical risks. In the modern world, it's possible uh, to involve the, the people uh, more actively in important public matters. Uh, and if it's possible, then we should do it. Now, this process of evolution that I've sketched so quickly um, over these slides is continuing. And the purpose of this slide is just to draw your attention to some of the changes that are already underway. And you, know, you can pick up any newspaper once your consciousness is aroused to this and you can see further examples of this in action. So we're seeing changes in public participation we're seeing changes in representation, and we're seeing changes in the relationship between them. And so the initiatives that I've listed on the screen, which you might watch, uh, include the following. There's a lot more emphasis on deliberation, uh, both within representative institutions and outside them. There's now a huge literature uh, on deliberative democracy. There's a lot of ongoing experimentation with something called mini publics where you bring together a random selection of citizens to discuss critical matters which are sometimes connected with constitutional change. And I've given you a link there to the Irish Citizens Assembly in 2016 to 2018, which played a critical role in ensuring that an abortion amendment uh, was, was accepted at referendum in Ireland. Uh, another initiative, progressive deepening of forms of public engagement, um, as in the uh, BBI case. Uh, a fourth type of, of initiative, the constitutionalization of public engagement. It's no longer necessarily just a, uh, an informal addition to a process of constitution making and change in Kenya at least, and probably some other uh, more recent constitutions. It is a cons constitutional engage, uh, public engagement is a constitutional requirement. Uh, we're also seeing increased use of the popular initiative for constitutional change. Discussions about the potential of sortition. I've given you a link there to uh, something called the Sortition Foundation, which explores the possibility uh, of using assemblies that are chosen randomly or by lot uh, in some ways uh, uh, even to the point of taking over from representative institutions, whether that's practical or not is another question, uh, but there's a lot of literature emerging on this. And of course, there's potential for very creative use of social media. Meanwhile, there are three longstanding problems and I know I'm running out of time, so let me finish with these quickly. One is the international dimension. This emphasis on public participation that we've been talking about is consistent with the idea of a constitution as a quintessentially national instrument. It's a symbolic national instrument and it provides a practical framework for government. But on the other hand, all constitutions are influenced by the external context in some way and to some degree. That's true in Taiwan in a very unusual way. It's also true uh, in Australia. And in some cases, the international influence is formative. Some constitutions are imposed, as in Germany and Japan. Uh, some are the result of a peace settlement involving the international community. Uh, some are made with the need for international recognition in mind. Uh, Timor-Leste is an example. Uh, some constitutions reflect pressure from international soft power. And most states in the global south uh, have constitutions that have been affected by international influence of that kind in one way or another. So how do you bring this together? The idea of a constitution as a national instrument on the one hand uh, and all this international influence on the other. International instruments try to do that by stressing that national ownership and leadership is important. But of course, you've got to do more than stress that. Uh, it's got to be true in practice uh, or that can lead to constitutional failure or underperformance. Now, this tension has not yet been fully resolved, but um, as someone who watches these things quite closely, I think I'm beginning to see signs of greater restraint by the international community in the ways in which they involve themselves 
uh, in domestic constitution making and also signs of pushback uh, from states in the global south. Second continuing issue, how do we balance public participation and elite buy-in? Much of the focus on constitution building that we've been looking at has been on extending and deepening public engagement and other forms of participation. But experience suggests that we need to attend to the role of the political elite as well. Why? We may need them for leadership and direction. Uh, they bring a capacity for negotiation that uh, the broad public uh, won't naturally have. Uh, and the elite, the political elite, ultimately will bear responsibility for implementation of constitutional change. Uh, and the, the, the need to balance these, um, these two uh, factors can be demonstrated in all sorts of ways by our case study, but certainly illustrated by the Chilean constitution making process, which involved a constitutional convention very weak party represent political party representation in that convention, very diverse and hugely representative convention with 155 members, drew up a very innovative constitution, but that's just been rejected by referendum uh, by a large majority across the country. So there's still a lot of discussion about why did that happen? How do we understand it? But one theory, which may be part of the answer, is that with lack of leadership in the convention itself, to hammer out a compromise that not only had broad support across the convention, but also reflected pockets of support uh, in the community at large. And then the final um, issue, the role of the referendum itself. Referendums add legitimacy to a constitutional process. They break up ordinary politics. Uh, but they're also expensive, complex, open to manipulation and unpredictable. And there are all sorts of recurring and widely shared problems, which I suspect that both Taiwan and Australia share. Should there be multiple issues in the same question? Should referendums be held with an election? How should people be informed about, represent about referendum proposals? And should people, the people themselves be able to initiate referendums? And so the thought I leave you with at the end of this slide is, does it, the answer to some of these questions depend on how we think about referendums? In Australia, they tend to be treated as sort of an unfortunate add-on to the representative process. It may be that the answer to some of these questions lies in thinking of uh, a referendum as a distinct form of public decision-making that attracts its own needs for a particular process and its own needs for information. And I, my sense is that that's the way in which thinking about these issues is moving. So final reflections, public participation has become increasingly important for both the theory and practice of constitutional change uh, and the significant experimentation which make, with making it effective. Almost every form of public participation has an interactive relationship with some kind of representation and that relationship also is continuing to evolve. Public participation in constitutional change is undoubtedly a global trend, but the forms it takes, the balance with representation and its effectiveness in practice varies with local context and aspects of context may be tradition, socioeconomic conditions, constitutional culture, geo geopolitical pressures uh, and other factors. Uh, and there's still much to be done through both theory and practice to maximize the potential of public participation and representation for healthy democratic constitutional development. So thank you very much. And I'm very sorry to have gone over my time. Thank you, Cheryl. That was great and wonderful. We all benefit quite a lot from your such passionate and uh, insightful uh, remarks. And, and we have lots to talk about and lots to learn. In the context of uh, Taiwan's constitutional moment, that is to test the constitutional revision mechanism as specified in 2005 
uh, that was a last round of constitutional uh, revision. And now we are testing whether we can survive that extremely high ceiling, not only in the, in the congressional vote, but also for public referendum. And that's why the whole society is wondering whether Taiwan is going to, you know, successfully uh, go through this constitutional referendum or not, or it's going to follow Chile Chilean example uh, of possible failure. And that's why we have lots of uh, concern from the citizen group, from the society, uh, from the government, and particularly the referendum is uh, going to be uh, in conjunction with the, uh, uh, one of the major local elections, the election mm -hmm. for males. So you talk about lots of the dynamics, including the relationship between election particip participation, representation, and deep down into the deliberation. Uh, so we have, we have three uh, discussion and um, sure, I will, I will promise you this is not an academic conference, so they are not a reviewer or discussion in, in any sense, you know, with regard to your, your speech. They are reflecting uh, their uh, uh, ideas, and even in some respect, even when eat their experience, good or bad, and, and maybe uh, sort of link to your one way to think of your, your remarks. Uh, let me introduce these three uh, discussion. Uh, the first with us and down far in the uh, far end uh, uh, is, is um, Yan Ting. Um, Yan Ting otherwise uh, go by Eddie. Uh, is a, a vice, is the deputy director for Taiwan Youth Association. Um, and she was also uh, president of the National Taiwan University Student Association. That means he has been pretty much involved in uh, all kinds of uh, public matters in his capacity as a student and me young. Uh, we, are, we are very happy to have you with us, and I'm sure you have lots of uh, inspirational ideas and also uh, some questions. Maybe some puzzles while observing Taiwan's, you know, constitutional development. Uh, and Wenwei, Christina Wenwei, uh, is, has been pretty much involved, in my opinion, uh, all corners of Taiwan's public uh, issues. She sort of has been trained as a uh, in the diplomacy, you know, sector. But she was not satisfied with that, so that's why she got into law and, and continued to work on uh, many public matters, issues. Uh, she's working on, of course, information, you know, technology and also democracy, of course, but primarily pretty much uh, concerned about gender equality and how uh, uh, women's rights and, and gender issue got uh, played down in this uh, transformative democracy uh, in Taiwan's context. Uh, wonderful to have you with us. And last but not the, the least, uh, Professor Su Yen Tu, um, he has been involved theoretically and also uh, practically in many issue related to democracy and election. As uh, he is the, I would say, the number one expert on law and democracy in Taiwan, and has been observing all kinds of uh, issues related to that, uh, not to mention constitutional uh, issue about, about that. Um, there is a kind of one personal reflection whenever I see you and I recall the time when I was, uh, you know, teaching constitutional law, and you were uh, one of my students at that time. And my daughter actually suffered from asthma, and that's why I have to take care of her in a constant way. 
And that's why there are some class meetings that I actually uh, sort of brought my daughter with me in the classroom. And so uh, my daughter was at that time, uh, you know, elementary <laughs> school student, and, and she was also your classmate at that time. <laughs> and Yen Tu has been very, very involved in in all kinds of constitutional issue and com particular competitive constitutional uh, matters. And, and I, I think uh, our discussion would have a very uh, sort of uh, pivotal and also very critical uh, uh, fraction of our, the issue uh, that uh, uh, Professor Saunders so nicely brought about to us. Shall we begin with Eddie? Eddie, you have the floor, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Ye, and thank you so much for the presentation, uh, Professor Saunders. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Yen Tin Lin. You can just call me Eddie. I'm the co-founder and deputy director of Taiwan Youth Association for Democracy, Taiwan Qingnian Minzhu Xiehui. I'm grateful for Tom Price's invitation to be here. It is my great honor to be on this stage again since the last time being the valedictorian of NTU Law class of 2019. Today, rather than being a commentator, I'd like to say I'm more like to echo Professor Saunders' idea that public participation has become more and more critical for the advocacy of constitutional change, especially in Taiwan in recent years. Considering the time limit, forgive me, I will skip the introduction to the pending amendment and leave the professional legal discussions for the following scholars. I'm going to share with you from the perspective of youth advocates what we've done and what we are doing right now for the coming constitutional referendum to lower the voting age and the age of candidacy from 20 to 18. This photo was taken on March 25th this year. It was on Friday, but as you can see, nearly 100 high school students voluntarily asked for leave. They hope to witness the historical moment and experience a more inspiring civic education class on the street. Because at the same time, legislators were in the chamber and voting to decide if the constitutional amendment to lower the to lower the voting age could be clear and sent to referendum. What surprised me was this event did influence the outcome. After the legislature passed the bill, the opposition party told us that in their internal meeting earlier, some of their legislators lobbied their college to vote yes. Meanwhile, they mentioned low students gathering outside won't forgive them if they changed their minds and broke their promise to support the amendment. So from this single case, I believe it perfectly proved that public participation could indeed play an important role. However, not every advocacy can go well like this. In fact, most of our efforts failed, or we can say not immediately paid off. To be honest, Lowe's experience frustrated us time after time. In 2014, NGOs like Taiwan Alliance of Advancement of Youth Rights and Welfares, Taiwan Xiaonian Chen Yu Fu Li Chu Jin Lian Meng, believed it was the best timing for Ma Ying Zhou administration to initiate constitutional amendments in 2014. Because it was his second term, he didn't need to worry about running for re-election. To urge the government to react, they launched National Teens Voting Day first time in 2014, which was a series of simulated polling events in high schools nationwide for mayors and a referendum to lower the voting age. In 2015, Constitutional Amendment Committee in the legislature was finally established, but it eventually failed to pass any constitutional amendment due to political calculations. That was the beginning I started to commit to this advocacy when I was a freshman in, at NTU. The initial thought was quite simple. I was 18 years old, uh, and I, I believe I knew more political knowledge than most elders, but why I couldn't vote. 
From 2015 to 2019, although we did realize that the constitutional amendment would happen in a short time because it was President Tsai's first term, we kept the, maintaining the momentum by lecturing in high schools and universities. You can see my partner, Harry, another NTU law alumnus, interacting with those teenagers and guiding them to think about why young people's opinions should be valued equally in the society. The positive feedback we received encouraged us to found Taiwan Youth Association for Democracy in 2018. We not only keep advocating for student rights, youth rights, and also civil rights for 18, but we also work on empowering teenagers through holding diverse programs like summer camps um, and simulated referendums inter integrated with student association elections, as you may see. Even in 2020, we invited all presidential candidates to exchange views in person on their platforms for use. Those movements all assisted us in showing the public that the young generation is well prepared to participate in civil society. And it's time to give these legal adults voting rights. During our advocacy, Interestingly, three countries in East Asia lower their voting ages, separately uh, including Japan, Malaysia, and South Korea. Those presidents pro uh, provided more cards to us to leverage to the government to put more resources into educating the civilians to eliminate public concerns and myths against allowing 18 to vote and run for the office. Japan was a good reference for us. This page you can see is from Japan Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications. The government even invited a famous actress to endorse lowering the voting age in 2016. We were happy to know our Central Election Committee invited the famous Taiwanese baseball player Guo Hongzhi this year to promote the constitutional referendum. It was probably a good start because not all actions for constitutional change need to be initiated by civil society. We also noticed some efforts from Japan's private sector to convince Japanese people that lowering the voting age is a global trend. One time when I had a lecture in Hualien, um, Yumi Uli Shinbun, uh, Du Mai Shinbun, even sent a couple of reporters to record that event and interview the students about our civic education. But I'd like to add that another interesting case we heard is from Malaysia. They amended their, uh, their constitution to lower the voting age in 2019. And we had exchanges with Malaysia's youth committees and they told us that the amendment there basically stand from politicians' idea instead of public initiatives. In 2020, President Tsai's second term started. Taiwan NGOs and experts believe President Tsai would try to build some political legacy through amending the Constitution. We raised several proposals, including reforming the electoral system of the legislature and adding human rights clauses and so on. On the other hand, we kept trying to maintain this issue being exposed to the public through different relevant approaches. For example, we continuously lobby the legislature to amend the age of majority in civil codes. And fortunately, we succeed. To reach out to more people as possible, one example we've done was also collaborated with Taiwan LGBT Pride in 2020, which was just the 18th year of the event. Because we believe on this, we communicate this issue with more people with diverse backgrounds and communities. It is unlikely to cross such a demanding threshold, just like Professor Ye mentioned. We need the support from the, more than half of eligible voters, which are 9.65 million ballots. I'd like to shout out to my partners and many volunteers. They now stand by the roads and walk into traditional markets to promote the constitutional amendment. In addition, 
We are desperate for the government, including the executive and the legislative branches, to take more responsibilities rather than just leave NGOs who only have limited resources to figure out how to achieve such a challenging objective. Last but not least, for my fellow Taiwanese, don't forget to vote yes to the referendum on November 26. Uh, when we're referring to uh, public participation, I believe it e exactly uh, includes each of you. So um, let's renew the Constitution together. Thank you again for having me here, and thank you for listening. Well, thank you, Yanting. You certainly make the best of this, uh, this time for advocacy. <laughs> uh, it's uh, in, in, uh, pretty much in tune with what we are talking about, as public participation, uh, public participation in constitutional revision. Uh, next, we have uh, Christina Wenwei with us. Wenwei, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Professor Ye, and thank you, uh, Professor Saunders and all the distinguished speakers here with me, and most importantly, all the young intellectuals here. I'm really honored to be here to share with you based on my experience as a practitioner promoting the gender equality here. As you have known, I have been involved with Awakening Foundation, which is Fu Nu Xing Zhi Ji Jin Hui, since I was a graduate student. Really, it really all happened here in anti-Liu Law when I was a student and I was able to uh, channel and to network with this public uh, civil groups. And now I am the director of Awakening Foundation. I hope this doesn't mean that I'm aging only. <laughs> but well, it really is a, a great journey for me to be able to experience and really to touch upon this uh, process of uh, promoting gender equality. So uh, in it all started from 2018. I was able to have a stronger tie as the director to work with all the public uh, civil uh, groups to promote gender equality, most of the time through the constitutional litigation. So first of all, I would like to emphasize that from the perspective of NGO activist, in the past decades, our main channel rely heavily on, as I mentioned, constitutional litigation. You can see from the slide here that there have been plenty of constitutional decisions tackling and promoting gender equality. You will see from this slide that finally women have the right to decide their residence in wedlock. You will see women's right to work at night, you will see women's right to inherit the property. All are protected through the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution as rendered by the Constitutional Court. As this is not a constitutional class here, so I'm not going to dig into all these cases. Here, I just want to remind all our friends, especially these young intellectuals, I want to emphasize NGO have made efforts to initiate and to network with the public, the scholars, the lawyers, the judges, the legislatures, all possible stakeholders to generate the gender articulation and try to strategize the possible agenda to be taken by the Constitutional Court. However, I would say even with all these milestones in hand, it is still very rare for NGO activists to be able to really say that we are involved in the direct constitutional making, especially in Taiwan, because the Constitutional Court has played and should play, as you are learning now, a passive role in the constitutional legal system. And especially the Constitutional Court has always held the power for their discretion on the taste taken. 
So with that condition, I have to say, most of the time, the NGOs work through the constitutional litigation is more like the Sisyphean's work, which is we do our best, we brainstorm, we hope for the best and prepare for the worst. Usually we don't know what's gonna happen, but we keep our positive thought and our expectation on what we can do. But recently such a situation has changed a little bit. Uh, what deserves a special attention is that through the pass of the Constitutional Court Procedure Act just recently, NGO now have a new panel to the new channel uh, to submit our uh, amicus curate, which is the Fa Ting Zhiyou Yi Jian Shu to the court. And now it has become a more important and crucial channel for all the NGO, NGO activists to articulate with the court. Uh, for example, in May 2020, in Judicial Yuan Interpretation Number 791, the Constitutional Court decriminalized uh, the criminal adultery and overruled the number 554, which upheld the criminal adultery constitutional. And I want to address this case because this case and this agenda have been pushed forward by Awakening Foundation for more than 30 years. And finally, uh, in, in 2020, we are able to see this happening. And in this case, Awakening Foundation had allied with other more than 10 NGO groups to stand before the Constitutional Court to, for a press conference. And we also submitted 10 amicus curiae opinion with the court. However, I want to emphasize, as we are all very delighted to see the Constitutional Court render the de decision in favor of us, however, the fact is, if you really dig into the opinion, you will see that Still now, the Constitutional Court rarely taken the NGO's articulations. Most of the time, the scholarly research, the statistics, the reasonings into their written opinion. So then the following question is, if so, why do NGOs still rely heavily on the Constitutional Court to promote gender equality? Instead of, as Professor Saunders today have enlightened to us, taking into account of the referendum for the constitutional making. The fact is, in the domain of promoting gender equality, the gender groups or any other groups have never initiated a referendum before, while the anti-sex, same-sex marriage group initiated three anti-gay referendum proposals. And unfortunately, in November 2018, the three referendum cases passed with the seven million to three million votes. So uh, with that in hand here, I tried to list several reasons why we have hesitation on uh, using referendum for promoting our agenda here, but this could not be uh, comprehensive, but I just want to draw here some of the reason here. That first, uh, for us, the gender uh, groups, we are more comfortable with the right-based articulation, because you have seen that, you already know that the court shall play the role as the counter-majority kind of function here, we are more comfortable if we are able to control the, uh, uh, control the panel here. So uh, that is one reason we rely heavily on the court and the right-based articulation. And second reason I want to address is that we understand that gender discourses are usually marginalized in the civil agenda. And that is really one reason we are we have the doubt in the past for us to really use referendum as one of the mechanism here. 
And thirdly, uh, that is something uh, we want to address here that we are kind of bound by the nature of our group. Okay, here I want to share that one joke is that Awakening Foundation is very often referred as the group of white collar, middle class kind of female, uh, female uh, f feminist because most of our group people are uh, incorporating with scholars, lawyers, or politicians. And with that in hand, we are naturally be comfortable with the approach we have taken. And fourth, most importantly, we need to allocate our limited resources efficiently. As you want to know that in Awakening Foundation, we only have five to six working uh, workers working with us. And really, you will see there are plenty of gender issues to be tackled. So really, maybe the Constitutional Court is one way for us to really better allocate our resources efficiently. So with all that in hand, when anti-gay groups have many political and economic resources to mobilize, to push uh, gender equality backwards, NGO groups have also realized that in the future, we must be able to fight in multiple fronts. At the same time, in the process of our participation in civic activities, we have gradually discovered that we must connect more young generations and empower them in multiple channels. And one of the way is really to empower the young generation as you all sit here, the opportunity to vote, through referendum to participate in the representation and really to strengthen your representativeness. After all, Taiwan has gone through plenty of constitutional moments. It is not healthy for the sustainable development of our democracy to only allow a few people, mostly the elder people, maybe just like me, to represent your generation. Therefore, I here want to come to my speech here today with such an appeal. I would look forward to your uh, feedbacks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wen Wei. Yeah, very awakening points to remember and also to elaborate. Uh, finally, we have uh, Yan Tu, uh, Professor Su, uh, Professor Su, you have the floor. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Ye, uh, and good morning, everyone. Uh, it was truly an honor uh, to share the stage with Professor Ye, my first Kanlo professor uh, and a longtime mentor, uh, my two uh, fellow panelists, uh, Yan Ting and Wen Wei, and above all, with uh, Professor Saunders, uh, whose uh, work, whose invaluable and path-breaking work uh, has truly uh, inspired so many students and practitioners in the beginning field of comparative constitutional law. So I'm fortunate to consider myself as one of them who are uh, so much inspired and inspired by Professor Saunders, and therefore we are very indebted uh, to her. So I, I guess the, the, uh, the best way for me to pay my tribute to Professor Saunders and, and serve as a panelist uh, in, in this forum uh, is to apply uh, Professor Saunders' uh, insights, especially her insights about the interdependence uh, between uh, participation and representation, or, or the, the, the very dynamic interactions between these two uh, important features uh, to the uh, current ongoing development of constitutional reform in, in Taiwan. Uh, so le let me begin um, by revisiting a very, very uh, challenging, important questions we face nowadays. Is it still possible to amend uh, the ROC constitution and thereby change our constitutional status quo in Taiwan? Uh, is it too difficult to, to, to do that nowadays? Uh, many people have that kind of wonders or, or questions, and many of them uh, attribute the problem 
to our 2005 constitutional amendment rules, we, we, because we set up a so onerous requirements, not just for a legislative proposal, but also for public ratification. I, I'm not so into that kind of answer. So, so let us dig deeper. And, and first by asking why we set up that kind of amendment, onerous amendment rules in 2005. Uh, I, I guess we can find uh, two objectives uh, these amendments want to achieve. Uh, first of all, uh, they certainly thought that uh, um, we, we just had too many amendments in the previous decade. Uh, so one of the, the, the objective is to reduce amendment frequency. But a, another objective is to have not just uh, incremental reforms in the 1990s, but they, they probably envision more comprehensive, uh, more structural uh, overhaul, constitutional overhaul in the future. And, and, and that, that's why they, 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 they set, set up a, a very, very high uh, threshold uh, for uh, constitu formal constitutional change. So here, let me introduce uh, to you uh, 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 a distinction. Uh, between constitutional amendment and constitutional replacement. Here, we, in, in, 2000, in 2005, what we established is actually not a constitutional amendment rule, but, constitu but, but better be characterized as constitutional replacement rules, if you follow my, my logic. So what we, what we are facing today is actually a problem of mismatch. We are using, uh, the, uh, we, are, we, are, we, we need to use the constitutional replacement rule to make single issue constitutional amendment. And that's very, really, really hard. So, so one of the problem is that uh, our major political parties simply cannot agree on uh, a set of, uh, we, we, we call, maybe we, we can call a package deal let alone a, a, a whole uh, project of rewriting the Constitution. They can, simply could not agree on this kind of a project due to our uh, political polarization. So the political polarization make them less willing to cooperate, and, and, and it's also less likely for, for one single party to control the uh, legislative supermajority required for uh, initiating the constitutional amendment process. And, and so we, we are not able to have that kind of uh, constitutional replacement. Think about that. If we, we, we cannot just amend, uh, we, we cannot just adding a few more additional articles. We can actually rewrite whole new, whole ROC constitution from scratch. And, and, and through the, 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 the very uh, onerous uh, amendment process. And then we will have a new constitution. But we cannot do that because uh, our political elites simply could not uh, have that kind of consensus uh, for us to, to, to go that way. And, and meanwhile, they can only agree on single issue amendment like the lowering of voting age uh, as Yenting and, and his uh, colleagues, his friends, so uh, advocate, uh, so firmly advocate for that course. But uh, sing single issue amendments are very, very difficult uh, to obtain the required uh, public approval. It's not just in Taiwan, it's, it, it's actually uh, a, a recent uh, empirical uh, studies in comparative constitutional law actually suggest that it's actually much more easier to pass a package deal of constitutional rep replacement uh, through a referendum than to pass single issue amendments. Uh, so that, I, I guess that's what we are, we are, we are facing uh, right now. And, and, and so two takeaways, two quick takeaways. Uh, first, um, there, there, there's a debate about whether it really matters to, uh, for having this kind of constitutional amendment rules, whether the rules matters. And one, uh, one important uh, school thought that maybe rules does matter, but that, not that much. It actually, in, and, and, and the, the, the rules are not working in the vacuum. 
Well, they actually interact with the, 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 the political context environment. So equally or even more important would be what they call amendment culture. Okay, so uh, if, 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 we, we, if we accept that kind of uh, ideas, then uh, maybe the problem cannot be solved uh, even if we lower the, the, the amendment uh, requirements. Uh, maybe, for, if, for example, from three-fourths of uh, super, uh, legislative majority to two-thirds, still equally very, still very, very hard. And, 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 and that gives us a sense about what's the really, uh, what the problem we are really facing right now. And, and so I, I, I really appreciate that Professor Saunders uh, gu uh, guide us to uh, further um, consider the complex, the complicated inter uh, interactions or interdependence between uh, what, what she called the public participation and representation. Or representation can, can also be, uh, a, a can be used uh, in different terms like elite buy-in or elite cooperation. Okay, so, so here, in, 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 right now, we can actually witness the, the interactions here in Taiwan. Uh, let me give you a, a few uh, evidences uh, of what we are, we, are, we, are, we are facing right now. So, you know, the, the, uh, the, even though the, 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 the amendment bill was uh, proposed by uh, the legislator, that by our legislative union, uh, it's act, the, 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 const, the required constitutional referendum actually has the effect of setting the political deadline for the legislators to, to, to do so. You know, it, because we know that it, it's, it, it takes 9.65 million people to vote yes, to, to pass a referendum. So we know that turnout is a really big issue. So therefore, it, uh, the, the constitutional referendum, if there is going to, be, uh, to have one, it must be held in, con con in conjunction, in, held together with a nationwide elections. Uh, so that we, we will have at least some, some, uh, 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 some uh, general turnout around 65%. Even in that turnout, it actually takes, if, if, you can't, if my math is correct, you actually take 77% um, voters turn out and say yes for the referendum to pass. So because that kind of calculation, so it actually set a political deadline for uh, legislator to move. They, they, they really need to uh, deliver something in, uh, b before uh, March 2022 for anything to happen. So th that, that's a, a, a strong uh, a power. And, but, and, and then uh, the legislators, they, they, since they face the deadline, they, they have a deadline to meet. They can either uh, agree and do something, or they can uh, they can take no deal. Like last time in 2015, the deal was broken because they couldn't agree on anything else. And this time, it's interesting that uh, there was also no negotiation between our major parties. So they chose a, a, an issue that need no negotiation because all political parties agreed on lowering the voting age. Uh, so, so that's why we have a, 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 a single issue and very important uh, amendment proposal uh, th later this year. And, and, and as you can see, the, the, the legislative, uh, the, the, the legislative or representations work also define, um, also have some certain impact on the success or failure of a constitutional referendum. Uh, just as I said, it's much easier if we have a deal package for voters to have an up or down vote and rather than uh, a single issue amendment. Uh, so if uh, unfortunately we could not pass uh, uh, the referendum uh, uh, in, in, December, in November, that's not entirely the fault of our citizens but our political leaders, they, they also bear their own, uh, they, they also bear their responsibilities. And, and, and finally, I want to emphasize that campaign do matter. So even though uh, some opinion polls show that uh, uh, there's still uh, not enough 
voters uh, or would-be voters support the con constitutional amendment, uh, support the lowering of voting age. Uh, but we, we know that uh, political campaign, vigorous campaign, not just by civil societies uh, like uh, uh, Yen Ting and, 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 and others, but also by political parties. They really need to uh, do their part and, and, and persuade uh, and invite people uh, to, uh, to vote yes in, 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 in November. Uh, if so even though uh, it's, it's just a, a single issue constitutional amendment, but if we can make it happen next time, you know, where the civil societies can actually generate a stronger political pressure for our political parties to make a, a more rigorous, more substantive package deal. And then we are getting closer to have a new constitution. So that's my hope. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. I, I, I'm happy that we have some dialogue with uh, 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 Professor Saunders' uh, presentation and that actually sort of they all uh, all of the uh, factors and elements and considerations uh, in the realm of constitutional making, um, particularly those were all drawn for from competitive uh, experience that happen in uh, in every part of the of the world, including in the past and something going on right now, and maybe uh, and we are sure. Uh, we, 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 we are sure that there will be more cases in the future for us to look to. Um, uh, I'm, I'm happy that uh, uh, we have lots of participation uh, from, uh, from the university and from the society, notwithstanding, uh, sure, notwithstanding this is the online uh, uh, forum, uh, but we have lots, some of the questions must we have some of the questions from the floor? Some may be addressed from the Slido, and some may, may, may be able to present from, from the floor. Uh, I'm particular, particularly uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 interested in uh, getting some of our guests you know, to, uh, to address, uh, to talk about particular young scholars and, and from the floor. And, uh, I, I also, I also would. I also would uh, uh, like to look into. Uh, would like to look into the slido and to see uh, lots of questions that presented, uh, presented by uh, by our our audience. Um, let me. Let me uh, name this question first, and then I'm going to invite some of the uh, some 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 of you from the floor. Um, together, we are going to have somehow Q and A uh, discussion. Um, the first question uh, uh, from the floor addressed to Professor Saunders is that: What is the general picture from competitive constitutional law? on age criteria for civil rights exercises. Uh, that is voting age issue. It's not going to have, going to ask you for the statistics, but some general picture about, about that. Uh, and also has a referendum lowering the age limit ever succeeded so basic rights of minorities could be exercised? So this is, this is the question uh, addressed from the slide. And of course, there are more, but let me just mention the other, the other one. Um, uh, there is a question for General, not for uh, Professor Saunders, and that is, is there really a consensus on constitutional amendment in Taiwan to support the current referendum initiative? Well, uh, it's actually a question, and this we do an empirical study. Otherwise, we don't know. But we would like to have our general reflection about that, if anyone has some thought about that, particularly uh, our discussion from the, uh, in, the, in the panel. But uh, while we are uh, sort of contemplating these issues, uh, I would like to get uh, some 
of us from the floor. Let me get uh, uh, Professor Lin Zhenzhi uh, from the uh, Academia Sinica. Yeah, Professor Lin, please. This is a question you mentioned in your slides, and that is, uh, should the people be able to initiate constitutional referendum? And to be honest, uh, the discussion, my colleague Professor Yen Tu Su had, and I had a discussion on this, and I'm persuaded by him that this is, or this may not necessarily be a good idea in the context of Taiwan, because if you allow the people, Taiwanese people, to initiate constitutional referendum, that may lead to uh, political polarization or in, and social division. And I would like to know your thoughts. Thank you. Yes, and we have Professor Chang uh, with National Taiwan University. Professor Chang, please. Charles, thank you so much for this wonderful lecture. I think you are definitely uh, uh, delivering a very successful one uh, here. And we really wish that you could be here in person, but definitely uh, that was going to happen. <laughs> I just want to draw a very uh, quick and important question for you. Uh, and it's involving in also and in reflecting in different uh, discussions, uh, questions. Public participation of constitutional change can be very tricky uh, if the constitutional change involves the minority rights. For example, this time in Taiwan, right, the, uh, the youngsters uh, voting uh, uh, right and also uh, in the upcoming Australian constitutional amendment, when it involves the First Nations, uh, really the voice and representation uh, design in the constitution. And you also meant, uh, heard about one ways uh, discussion about how women's rights or LGBTQ uh, groups' rights can be very tricky uh, when it comes to constitutional amendment. And then the public participation can invite really the pushbacks uh, how will you think about this? Thank you. Um, I think let's uh, get, this, get this for the first round, and we'll open to more uh, questions. We have uh, one question about uh, the initiation of public referendum for constitutional uh, revision and, and uh, the wisdom to that, you know, uh, and, also, and also that uh, 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 First Nation issue and representation, and you know, reflecting to different kind of uh, different kind of groups uh, in the process of a constitution. Can we can we get uh, uh, Cheryl to respond first, and then we will right. we will move on to, to to more questions. Yes. Yeah. Do you want me to res to, to respond to the one on uh, age limits as well? Yes, if you could. Yes. Okay, so quick answers to those three very interesting questions. Of course, I have no uh, quantitative answer to the question about uh, age limits. Uh, I'm sure it would be possible to generate uh, that with a bit of work. Um, but my impression is that 18 is a fairly normal age limit uh, for the exercise of political rights. Uh, and that if anything, the pressure is downwards. So there is now beginning to be discussion about uh, dropping the age limit to uh, 17 or 16 uh, in countries around the world. Whether a referendum on age limits ever succeeded, um, if we're talking about minority age limit, uh, again, that's something that could be worked out. I don't know, but can I just say this? Um, I'm a little bit less depressed than <laughs> Professor Xu about the possibility of single issue referendums getting up. I mean, if there's a sense in which the referendum that's coming in Taiwan, and I understand the difficulty of turnout, and that's obviously significant in the Taiwanese context, but if you can just get it over the, the line, it will be a wonderful precedent. You, it will have energized and engaged young people in constitutional change, which is very hard to do in many parts of the world. It will have made them aware of the constitution and of the processes for change. Um, and, uh, um, and it will have done so in a way where uh, apparently the political parties are both supportive, which is also not a bad culture to be setting. 
uh, whether that sort of ultimately ends in the sorts of pacted arrangements that Professor Shu was talking about is, is another matter. So, I mean, there's, a, there's, there's more at stake than just age limits, I think, in this coming referendum in Taiwan. And I, I very much hope it's successful. And one of the questions that arose from a number of the presentations is, well, what does the government do to support this referendum or the political parties? You know, what, what sort of information are they putting out? What do you think they should be doing on the hustings? And that's a really important issue in any country where there is a referendum process for constitutional change. Um, on the second question, should people be able to initiate referendums? You know, I'm not sure um, that there is an absolute moral answer to that. It will depend a lot on context um, and a lot uh, on the extent to which initiation might prove divisive. One way of dealing with that is to limit the range of issues uh, that might be um, uh, dealt with by popular initiative. We in Australia are at the other extreme where only the Commonwealth Parliament can initiate referendums. And the result of that is that you tend to get referendum questions that only the, go the government of the day is interested in having passed, which the people generally aren't very interested in, and so they vote no. And so there's, there's a need to, 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 to free up the initiation process in some way, but of course you don't want to do it, uh, so that it becomes a divisive force uh, in the community. Uh, and then that, that comes back to... Um, uh, to Wen Chen's very important question. Uh, uh, pu public participation, I mean, I think the cat is out of the bag as long as, as at least as far as public engagement uh, is concerned. But of course, it can be divisive. I mean, we had um, uh, a referendum on, not a referendum, just a popular vote, uh, non-binding vote on gay marriage a few years ago. And it was hugely divisive because extreme groups were um, totally unrestrained in the comments that they were uh, prepared to make. Um, and we will see much the same in relation to this Indigenous referendum. Um, but somehow we've got to deal with that, I think, because I think we will, I mean, you'll get public engagement anyway on social media, whatever happens. So somehow we've got to deal with it. Uh, in, in, in our context, the Indigenous referendum is being assisted by the fact that the new incumbent, pretty popular government is supporting it uh, right down the line. Um, uh, and that's very important, but that's not always uh, an opportunity that you have available. So yes, you're quite right, this is an issue, um, but it's an issue that we're gonna have to deal with in ways other than, I think, saying let's not have public participation. Great, thanks. OK, and open more discussion from the floor. Uh, Yang Yawen, Professor Yang, please. Um. Um, I'm Yaoyin Yang, uh, a research fellow um, at the Institution of Law, Academia Sinica, and thank Professor Sanders for this insightful talk. It showcases a fruitful uh, research trajectory and bring about a significant theme for future discussion. And I'm particularly curious about your thoughts on the future of constitutionalism under strong public participation of constitutional change. I'm no expert of a comparative constitutional law, but my intuition is that um, one normative implication of systematic and intensified public participation is that it will necessitate a weaker and thinner idea of constitutionalism, since the idea of a constitutionalism stands for a series of substantive values that we shielded um, from majoritarian changes. So the stronger an idea of constitutionalism that we have, the less space that we will offer to dynamic public participation for constitutional changes. And one related in institutional implication may be that the constitutional court's authority to embodied the output of strong pu pu public participation shall be weakened 
and therefore the possibility of unconstitutional constitutional amendment may become remoter. And for some commentators, this is an unwelcome development because they think this may undermine um, the safeguard for individual liberties. And I think this also um, uh, resonates what Professor Zhang just asked. Um, but the Kenya BBI decision that you just mentioned may also represent a very interesting counterexample to this comment. So um, may I invite you to share your thoughts on the potential tension between constitutionalism and public participation in constitutional changes? Okay, well, whether there is any further question or? Sure. Yeah. Are you ready? Are you ready to read respond to that question? Yeah. Constitutional. Yes, please. Yes. Um, really interesting and and challenging question. Um, uh, and of course, there is a, a danger that if we open it up to uh, the public, then um, whether because of lack of understanding or lack of commitment to constitutional values, things will be watered down. Um, but and maybe that's part of the, the time we're in anyway, where there's such concern about democratic backsliding. Um, but it's hard to freeze the system um, because uh, we can't put all our faith for everything in constitutional courts, constitutional courts and courts with a constitutional jurisdiction play an extraordinarily important role. Uh, in constitutionalism, but we've just seen from what's happened in the US uh, that if you put too much weight on, on judicial decisions and let the views of representatives and the views of the people just slide away on a completely different tangent, then that's a problem too. Uh, and so somehow uh, we've got to bring it back. Um, now, um, uh, and, and it's also true that in many of our systems, you know, the, the views of representatives are not terribly supportive of um, values of constitutionalism either. And I think to some extent they are losing track uh, of what constitutional values are. So the question is whether we can harness these processes in a way that is more constructive, that are actually educational, that help people to see why constitutions matter uh, and how constitutional values can actually be useful uh, and important for everyone, all of us in establishing stable, prosperous uh, societies. There's a sense in which that movement towards mini publics that I mentioned uh, is a positive one. Um, I mean, that those are um, assemblies comprising, you know, maybe a hundred people, but rather than just reacting on social media, they're being brought together in some sort of context where they get to know each other, where they get balanced presentations from people with a range of different views uh, and where they come out with ideas. Uh, and for that Irish assembly that I mentioned in my talk uh, to have come out positively in favor of abortion rights under the Irish constitution, which everybody thought was completely impossible, um, is a remarkable thing. Now, one of the interesting things about this um, mini public development is that it tends to be happening primarily in Europe. Um, it uh, uh, certainly hasn't caught on elsewhere in the world, whether that's for cultural reasons or whether it's for um, economic reasons. Um, but it's something that it, I think it would be worth thinking about in all our countries, whether that sort of process can be harnessed uh, and to, uh, to develop public participation in a way that's positive. Can I also just add one point, and it's really an answer to that earlier point of Wen Chen's. Um, even though I completely agree with her that uh, when a change involves um, minority rights, it can encourage a very bitter and unpleasant debate. And even though I said that happened in the Australian context for, um, for in, in the gay marriage plebiscite, um, what actually happened in that plebiscite, however, is that public opinion broke, that broke the log, log jam in the representative uh, institution, in the parliament. They were too scared and too divided to go down that path. 
when they actually ended up asking the people in that particular context, the extent to which gay marriage was supported by ordinary people across Australia was absolutely extraordinary. Now, I know that's just one example in one country, but you can, you can look at these things from different ways and we all understand our own context and we just need to weigh up what the best tools are that we can employ to best advantage in our own situation. Great. Well, Cheryl, it has been a, a, a great uh, moment for us. Uh, I may mean, call it constitutional moment, the academic constitutional moment that you show with, uh, uh, you know, this, this food, which is so rich and, uh, and, and out, of, out of tremendous experience and, and inspiration. And, and I, I think uh, all of us benefit quite a, a lot. But I just want to bring uh, some of the con context of this uh, conference for you in the floor. Uh, there are quite a number of students who is just taking constitutional law course, and they are here. Uh, they begin their they be, begin their academic uh, journey or constitutional learning here in National Taiwan University Law School, and I wonder with your experience and with your uh, with, with your vision. Uh, would you like to say, particularly say a few words to them, to encourage them on, or to deter them? On, you know, you, you may choose. Yeah, please. I'm very happy to do that. Um, let me just say that constitutional law and comparative constitutional law is one of the most important and interesting parts uh, of a law school curriculum. And I hope you really enjoy it. One of the uh, important things that has always occurred to me. Um, uh, Professor Ye mentioned in introducing me that I began as an Australian constitutional lawyer. And that's true. I have a really deep knowledge of my own constitutional system. And that has stood me in very good stead in comparative constitutional law because it helps me to understand that everybody else has very complex and deep constitutional systems as well. It's not just us and we look and sort of can uh, give advice to everyone else. Uh, everybody um, needs to be really steeped in constitution in their own constitutional system and then they can really begin drawing on uh, all the wonderful uh, insights that you can get uh, from the rest of the world. Let me also say this, don't get discouraged. Constitutional law can be hard as well, uh, much harder than other uh, branches of law where the answers are always more certain. Um, and so I, in my experience, students can sometimes get a bit frustrated with constitutional law because you're always saying, well, on the one hand this and on the other hand that. Uh, but it's such a reward, rewarding field of intellectual and practical study that I really hope you enjoy it very much. Well, well thanks a lot. And, and maybe with this, you may be able to spend, consider spend, say, uh, one semester or two you know, visiting uh, this law school or other institutions in Taiwan, I mean, and, and also sort of uh, teach one or two courses, you know, while uh, no Taiwan's uh, constitutional context even further and bring that into your rather rich picture of constitutionalism, you know, in the in the world, this is this is, this is remarkable, and, and we benefit quite a lot from from you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think uh, I think we have we have uh, had a, a wonderful discussion, and uh, looking back, but also looking forward. But more importantly, we stand in Taiwan, but we have a vision, we have global view about what's going on in the world, and and that's that's what we are. That's why while we are here, we shine, but we want to shine with the, with, with the whole world. Um, but at the same time, we need to know uh, ourselves very well, just like show, just the message show just uh, sent to us. Even though we do comparative constitutional law, even though we are, uh, you know, world citizen, 
but we still need to know our society uh, better in order to sort of face to, you know, face to the world. This is our, this is our take. And uh, I'm sure that what uh, Professor Saunders, you know, uh, present to us uh, won't be the, won't, it, won't be the last, last time, won't be the last one. She will, well, I, I, I'm sure uh, I'm sure we would invite you and, and you would accept, you know, in the future more, more discussions like this. And at that time, uh, we are hoping and we, we are sure and we insist on that, that uh, you are going to be here with us. You know, there will be, a, there will be a, a, a something that we, we all very excited about and look forward to. Thank you very much, Cheryl. I uh, wish you a, with your present day and health and, and, and also thank you for our discussion and for all the participants here. And we look forward to further discussion in the future. Thank you. Thank shall, you. We, shall we take a photo? Uh, shall we take a photo like with, uh, with that in the background? Yes. Uh, yes. Freeze the moment for future. Okay. Okay. Shall we all say we love you, Cheryl? <laughs> we, we love, love you, you Cheryl. <laughs> okay, let's do it once again. Da 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 da. Oh, okay, go. We, we love, love you, you Cheryl. Cheryl. <laughs> thank, thank you all very much for a really exciting master forum. I appreciate it enormously and for your hospitality. I look forward to meeting uh, in real life soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Saunders. Thank you, Professor Ye, for this inspiring discussion. The 2022 Tom Price Master Forum in Rule of Law has now come to an end. For the audience right here and everybody online, we thank you all for your participation and hope you have a nice day. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 现在请唐奖教育基金会执行长陈振川执行长上台与各位贵宾合影请张文正教授、尤美女律师、中研院林老师还有宋承恩老师一起上台一起合影